Everybody settled in and comfortable? Amen. 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 Thank you, Mary. That was, that was beautiful. And uh, truly, you know, as we just reflect on how much God loves us and how much we love God, um, you can kind of just stay in that place for a long time. Sometimes that's what we need. Uh, and that's what we're going to get this evening. Uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, we came to chapter 6. We finished chapter 5 last week. As you're turning to Deuteronomy 6, just a real quick recap. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5, many people are very familiar with it. At least used to be back in the day. It's known as the Ten Commandments. The Ten Words. And it is a repetition of what we already heard, all the words that God spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai uh, in Exodus chapter 20. But there in Deuteronomy, we're now on the frontier of the Promised Land, right across the Jordan River from Jericho. And God moves on Moses to write these things down, that they would be recorded that those children and their children and their children's children would have these words. Now these ten words, literally, we often call them the Ten Commandments. They're often referred to as the Law, or a portion of the Law of Moses, the first five books of the Bible. Many people look at them as rather harsh and exacting, strict, and... Uh, too difficult to live up to these laws. Who can, who can possibly live up to these laws? And A, nobody. Okay? Only God. Jesus himself fulfilled these Ten Commandments, but he's the only person ever to walk the face of the earth to do it, and that's because he is God. He's the author of the law. He is the fulfiller, the finisher, and he's done that for us. Um, I had seen it kind of shorthand, there's a lot of like the Cowboys Ten Commandments or these different kinds of things. I didn't bring any of those for you. You can look them up. They're really fun. Um, but I, looked, I like to look at these in one way. Is it's an opportunity for us to show our love to God, to express our love to God. If you were in a relationship with your spouse, wouldn't it be good to know what your spouse likes so that you can do things that your spouse likes? You know, what's your favorite flower? Where do you like to go out for dinner? Um, what kinds of things can I do that would bless you, that would put a smile on your face? And, and ideally, in this relationship, we could grow better at it over time. Not that we're ever perfect. Raise your hand if you're married and you have a perfect marriage. Well, yay, Steve. Good answer. <laughs> But we, we do all, you know, stumble occasionally from time to time. These are guidelines. And truly, that is what these words are about. God is guiding us into a good, wholesome, loving relationship with Him. You could kind of distill them in this way. Uh, the, the ten words for holy living. Number one is about relationship. I'm the God who brought you out of Egypt. You will have no other God before me. Relationship. Mm -hmm. The second one is about worship. And not, not making any carved images. Right? The, the next one is reverence. Um, that you will not take my name in vain. Uh, then time. So critical to any relationship. We need to be spending time with one another. And he would say, you need to keep that Sabbath day holy. And then he goes on into our relationships with one another. That in expressing our love to others made in the image of God, also fashioned in their mother's womb by God for good works that they would walk in them all the days of their life, we can relate to one another with, through our family, honoring our mother and father, right? And family and societal ties. Um, through the sanctity of life and respecting life from conception until God takes us home. Um, and purity, um, no adultery, right? Keeping things pure and undefiled. Um, respecting property, 
that we all have been endowed by our Creator with gifts. And, and, and it's interesting in the Declaration of Independence, to say we're going around writing that, it says that we, it's self-evident that we've been endowed by our Creator with certain uh, inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and property. Remember that? You might remember it as pursuit of happiness. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest issues at the time that they wrote the Declaration of Independence was this issue of property rights. Well, some people don't have property, and there was a, a lot of things they had to wrestle out, so they changed it from property to the pursuit of happiness, the, 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 the ability to go for it, you know, get, get something out of life. In speech, thou shalt not lie. We can worship in our speech. We can love in our speech. And in contentment, not coveting, but being grateful um, for the things that God has given us, for the spouse that God has given us, for the kids that God has given us, for the jobs that God has given us, for the food that God has put on our table. These are all ways that we can enter into and express our love relationship with God. Okay? So now he's going to compound this as we go forward. Uh, chapter 6, verse 1. Now this is the command, commandment, and this word is emphatic. This you will do. It's not optional. Okay? This is the commandment, and these are the statutes, or the decrees, um, and the judgments, or the consequences, the verdicts. These are, these are the statutes, the judgments, which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess. That you may observe them. He doesn't just give us a bunch of rules so that we can check in once in a while and see how we're doing, or again, to the marriage relationship, when we've blown it, then we go check the book and see where we got wrong. It's better that we would live in it and not go off the path. I like what Jude has to write. Um, in, in the book of Jude, uh, he says to us, Beloved, while I was diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write, it, write to you exhorting to contend earnestly for the faith. There's going to be a battle for our faith. But as he winds through all of these um, potholes and obstacles and things that we have to work for in fighting for our faith, just like we fight for our marriage, we fight for our children, and today, in our society, we fight for our faith. It, it's, it's in the battleground. It's, it's in the public square. But Jude would say, be, but you, beloved, in verse 20 of Jude, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, and this is what I like, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for mercy, the mercy of our Lord and Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Keep ourselves in the love of God. That's what these words are for, to keep us in the right relationship, to keep us in the love of God, to keep us in in Christ to make sure that we're under the spout where the glory pours out. This is the good place. That's where you need to stay. And again, in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, we read, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Chesed. A, a loving relationship. And this is what God is, is, is putting forward now. That you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess. Verse 2, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. And so this is why he is doing this to him. He had just finished up in chapter 5. He says, You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord God has commanded you, that you may live and that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess. Four times in the last chapter, 
that it may be well for you. God would say, I know the thoughts that I have for you. To prosper you. Not to hurt you. To give you a future. To give you a hope. And that's why we have all these things. And that is what he is encouraging now through Moses. Right there on the shores of the Jordan River. Before they go into the promised land. Listen. I've given you the road map. If you stay in this center lane with me. It's going to be great. Okay? And it's just good for us to remember these things. And he said, not only should we observe them, but we should pass it on to the next generation, that they would pass it on to their generation. Okay, verse 3. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord God your fathers has promised you, and a land, multiply greatly as the Lord your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, this is a beautiful thing, right? Who wouldn't want to live in a land flowing with milk and honey? Well, you might need some boots if you're walking around in all that milk and all that honey, right? <laughs> that idea of a land flowing in milk and honey the, the promised land, the land of Israel, other than the Jordan River, which runs across the eastern border, is solely, completely dependent on God to bring rain. They, they have a, a couple springs, they have some intermittent streams, but fundamentally they need that rain the, the, that God will bring in and he'll just rain upon the land. And when the land is flourishing then all the flowers are, are going, and the, the grass is rich, and the cows are producing milk, and the goats, right? And the bees are just busy with all those flowers, and those orchards, and the, the honey and the milk is just flowing. That's what that means, that this land that you're going to would be, uh, sustain you, but not just sustain you, would just be just abundant. Just a blessing. But it is predicated in that you observe these guidelines. And it's the same with a marriage, right? Happy life, or happy wife, happy life. Those, those kinds of things that we kick around, right? There's, we say that because there's truth to it, right? If we could just take care of our relationship with our spouse, if we could just take care of our relationship with our Lord, I think it goes something like this. See, first, the kingdom of God and His righteousness, then all these things, right, will be added to us, right? And so it's just getting the horse before the cart, just making sure that we've got everything hooked up right. So, Hear, O Israel. And he goes again in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. This is a big verse, especially if you are Jewish. This is like the national creed, the slogan. All devout Jews will say this over every morning and every evening. And every time they gather for service in the synagogue on the Sabbath or any special occasion, they will always start with, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. I'm going to read it on through and then I'm going to break this down and we might camp here for a little while because there's a lot in this. It says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates." These are important words. Now, 
This is not just speaking of verse 4. Here, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Just memorize that. Okay, that's, there's much more. He's talking about all these words that he's spoken, these commands that you shall do, that it may be well with you. And, and it's so important that you do this. But it begins with hearing, right? We, we read, faith comes by hearing. hearing and hearing by God. the Word of God. So we need to, we need to listen up. And this is what this, this, this idea of hearing is all about. Now, for starters, this, it's called, just for what it's worth, the Shema. It would kind of be spelled something like S-H-E-M-A. But we're going from Hebrew, so that's kind of a transliteration. But it's a Shema is the word. And that is the word for hear, to to use your ears, hear, listen, okay? But there's a difference between listening. I can be listening for somebody to come through the door. Did anybody come through the door? I don't know. But if I say I hear somebody coming through the door, has somebody come through the door? Yes. You can listen without hearing. But God doesn't say, listen, Israel. God says, hear. Israel. I, I want this to enter in. It's got to go through the ear gate. It's got to get into the heart. He had just emphasized that twice. These words shall be in your heart. How are we going to get them in our heart? Hear. Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In this business of hearing O Israel remember Israel is the name that God gave to Jacob the father of 12 sons who would become the 12 tribes of Israel now these 12 tribes are here and they're listening and as a group as a whole they're known as Israel after God changed the name of Jacob Jacob the heel catcher Right. Jacob, the, the cheat, the, the conniver, right? And, and God had to finally break him down at uh, the Jabbok River, not far from where they are right now, and, you know, bust his hip, and, and, and finally he says, okay, now you are governed by God, ruled by God. And that name, ruled by God, governed by God, that's Israel, Israel. So here, those of you who are ruled by God, okay, in submission to God, you're listening and you're hearing God. Hear, O Israel, and hear the Lord. And if you look in your Bible, no doubt it is all capital letters. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. We know that as the tetragrammaton. Or the four letters. That's literally what tetragrammaton means. And they're four letters and they're unpronounceable because we don't have the vowels or the vowel marks. And that was done on purpose by the Jews, not in Moses' day here. Very well, they would have known God by this name, YHVH. But over time, they left the vows out so that they wouldn't break the third commandment. Do you remember the third commandment? Do not take the Lord's name in vain. Don't say my name emptily or recklessly or in a derogatory fashion. And people were like, oh, we don't want to take his name in vain. I know, we'll just take the vows out. And then we can't say his name. And then we can't accidentally, accidentally take it in vain. It'd be like me taking the vowels out of my wife's name. And her name would be S-H-R-L. Shrill. That's actually one of the nicknames a lot of people that have known her her whole life. Shrill. Not, she doesn't like it. Don't say it to her. You're not going to have friends with her. 
but I don't say it to her, right? <laughs> Not if I want to, you know, have a happy nice life. <laughs> I'd be in a warm place to stay. It's like, don't you know my name? That's not how you say my name. You know? Isn't it interesting with us how names are so important to us? It, it's something that you'll learn this right away. You know, wherever you are in any kind of public uh, ministry setting, management, leadership, uh, directing, guiding people, doing things like that, probably the most important thing you can do, and you can pray for this if you're not good at it, is to learn people's names. You can, you can blow it on almost every single place and you'll be forgiven. But if you don't remember a person's name after the 7th or 14th or 23rd time you meet them, the relationship kind of goes sour. And you just come up, hey brother, hey sister. You know, you've been calling me that for like 14 years now. Do you know my name? <laughs> I, it's not easy. I get that. But in this case, Israel has said, here, listen up. Get it in your heart. The Lord. Okay? And this is the definite article. T-H-E. The. Not a Lord or an or whatever. And I say that to kind of bring out that this is a personal name. While we don't know how to pronounce it, it'd be the same as Mike, or Cheryl, or Brad, or Awanda. It's a name. It's God's name. Okay? And that's why it gets the definite article, and that's why it gets all capital letters. Because it's a real name. Now, with the vowels going missing, nobody really knows how to pronounce it. In fact, the Jews, to this day, will usually just say Hashem. Ha is the, and Shem is name. So when they get to this, they just say Hashem. They'll read this, Shema Israel, Hashem, Eloheinu, Hashem, Echad. Okay? Because they don't know how to say the name, they don't want to say the name. And uh, that's how they would do that, Hashem. Um, down through the years, people have guessed and put letters in there. The most common one that's out there is where they took the Hebrew word for Lord to mean a master or a boss, you know, your employer or something like that. And that's the Hebrew word Adonai. Adonai. That's Lord, but that's not capital L-O-R-D, right? That's just a title of something. This is a personal name. But they took the vowels out of that. Okay, it's Lord. We'll take the vowels and borrow them and we'll put them over here. And they would come up with something uh, close to Yehovah. Okay? And so you've heard of Yehovah. You might have heard of Jehovah. I can guarantee you this isn't Jehovah. You know how I can guarantee you it's not Jehovah? Because it's Hebrew and there's no J in the Hebrew language. <laughs> It can't be Jehovah, okay? But it's the same with Jesus. We say Jesus, but his name would have been Yesu. Yes. Okay? Um, Yeshua would be his more proper name and contraction, Yesu. Um, but, so it's not Jehovah. And then another way that people have come about using it is Yahweh. Yeah, Yahweh. And so, and you'll get this four letters, capital Y, capital H, capital V or W. Have you noticed that you can get one or the other sometimes and then a capital H? And the reason for that is with the, the W letter, it's often pronounced V. So it could be Yehovah, Yahweh, or Yahweh, right? But nobody knows for sure. And I say all of that so that you're wondering, well, what do I do with all this now? <laughs> I know you've probably heard me say this before, but God has given us a way out. He gave us His Son. Amen. And we know Him, God, His Son in the flesh, as Jesus. Okay? And I'm going to get into a couple things in just a second here, expanding upon what I like to call Yahweh God, 
That's probably my favorite. You pick whatever you want. Don't do it because I say it or whatever. You like Jehovah. If you've grown up that way, that's fine. It doesn't really matter. Um, or Lord. You can just say Lord. That's fine too. But here, O Israel, the Lord, our God. Okay? So the Lord. Definite article, the Lord. That's his name. Our God. Okay? And so this word, God, you might be familiar with it, is Elohim. Now, in the Hebrew, there's three fundamental ways of describing a God. And this, a God in this term, this way, is that being that is worshipped. Okay? The word God that we have, G-A-W-D, God, <laughs> it's just God. It comes out of the Teutonic Germanic dialects into Old English, but it means the one who is invoked. That when we speak or pray and we are invoking or calling to, we're, we're, we're God. We're speaking to deity. And that's where we get the word God for English. But when we say this, God, it's really Elohim. And Elohim, again in the Hebrew, there's three fundamental ways that you could talk about God in the Hebrew. One is El. E-L. Like my name. Michael. M-I-C-H-A-E-L. Okay? And it's a compound word from Micah, which is who is like an L, God. Who's like God? And so a lot of times you'll see names with an E-L. You can't assume, but if you dig deep, a lot of names that end in an E-L or have an E-L somewhere in it are a, a, a reference to God in some way. And, and again, and you'll also find that with um, with Yah or Yahweh or like Jesus' name, Yeshua, the Y-E is for the Yahweh and it is God, is salvation. So, you'll see these things kind of peppered into different things you read or whatever, kind of fun to look at, but here... God is talking through Moses to the children of Israel. Listen up. I want you to hear Israel, governed by God, me, the one and only Lord, Yahweh, our God, our Elohim. Now, El is God, singular. Elah would be a dual God, two gods, a binary God. Um, it's kind of common in some weird uh, Greek type things. Uh, uh, it's like one coin with two faces. And usually the Elah then is in the feminine. And then you get El, Elah, and El O Him. Now, I am at the end of a Hebrew word often makes it plural. Like a, you have Kerub and Kerubim. Now, you know the cherubim, the cherubim are little baby angels flying around in diapers, right? <laughs> but one of them is a cherub. It's not a cherubim. That would be a whole host of angels, a bunch of them. Same with this word God. It's multiple plural gods in the masculine. I'm breaking this all down for you because it really means a lot in how we know and understand who God is. And he stopped all the children of Israel. Before we go into the promised land, you start walking by the Spirit and rocking it in a land flowing with milk and honey. I want to make sure you understand our relationship again. Listen up. Me, Yahweh God, our God, am a plurality. And this is what it says, the Lord our God, Elohim. But then look what he says. The Lord, there it goes again, 
definite article, tetragrammaton, is one. Now this word one in the Hebrew comes from a definition of a compound unity. We might say um, we are one in the spirit. How many of us are there? I don't know. It's a lot. But we refer to us as echad, a compound unity. And that's what this word defines. There's another word, yakid, which is an absolute singularity, a one. Not any parts, indivisible. That would be a different one. But God chose to use this word, echad, which is a compound unity. Now, What's interesting in this is, keep in mind, they're on the border, they're going into the promised land, they're to wipe out all these foreign people with all their foreign pagan gods. They were polytheistic people, which means polytheistic, many gods. Right? They would have the God of the sky and the God of the river and the God of the fire and God of the... Well, in the Egyptian pantheon of gods, where they had been redeemed out of, we see the ten plagues that God put upon Egypt. And every one of those plagues targeted some form of Egyptian deity. The cow god, the river god... Uh, you know, all of these different, the, the light, the, all these things, every one of them, God was just shooting down their gods. And I use the word little g, gods, okay? They're false deities, okay? We can often interchange this word for uh, gods with idols, okay? Representatives of what we project to be gods, one of the weirdest things, and you can, this one works every single time. It's so cool. But when you look at all these different gods that are around the world, whether it's in Hinduism or uh, Shintoism or whatever, whatever religion you want to look up, all these gods are always a projection of human qualities, human aspiration, human characteristics. Because we don't know how to create a God that we don't know about. So we always project ourselves into that God. And maybe we like to say, well, there are better angels. If we're noble and we want to aspire to do good. But however we do it, what we're doing is breaking the second commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. But how do we have you for our God, an invisible God... That's kind of hard. An all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, all-loving, all-merciful, all-gracious. All, you're everything. You're, I, I can't even begin to scratch the surface of who you are. I mean, even if I studied my whole life and knew everything about the science and history of planet Earth and the moon and the solar system, that's barely a speck in God's creation, and God exists outside of his creation, and where are you going to go with all that? And yet, in all of this, God is letting Israel know, I am your God, the Lord, I have a name, we have a relationship, and this is what's so interesting, that God has taken them out of a land of polytheism, to go into a polytheistic society and to break down all their idols and altars and, and corruption and replace it with worship of one God. And in fact, that's what the Jews would tell you. And often, there can be a little contention between Jews and Christians. The Jews would say, well, we're monotheistic. Mono is one. Theistic is believe in one God. We only believe in one God. There's only one God. A lot of Jews, maybe a little bit less learned, 
<clears throat> which is probably like a lot of Christians, a little less learned. But they will read it right here and say, see, it says right here, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There's only one God. We're monotheistic. We don't believe in a bunch of gods like you Christians. Wait a minute. We would say, we're monotheistic. And they say, no, you aren't. You worship uh, Father, Son, and Mary. Oh, dear. <laughs> or Father, Son, and the Holy Bible. Holy or Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we say, well, one God. In three persons, one essence, distinct personalities. We have a, a, a little label we put on it we call the Trinity. Okay? Now, the word Trinity is not in your Bible. You're never going to find Trinity in your Bible. But you will see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit addressed as, described as, acting as God on so many different levels. The Bible speaks of each one, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as having life, as having, being omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, eternal, holy, loving, and true. All of those things describe the Holy Spirit. They all describe the Son. They all describe the Father. There's an ancient diagram that's kind of drawn with God in the center. And then a spoke going out, three spokes, and it says, you could say God, and then is, is one of the spokes, God is Father, God is Holy Spirit, God is Son. But then between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the lines that connect that would be is not. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. Okay? Now, the Trinity is one of those things, if you're a parent, good luck. <laughs> Trying to explain that to your children. Okay? Part of what we're doing is we're trying to understand an infinite God with our finite mind, with our finite reference points. We really can't put all of that together. Uh, there's a couple places in the scripture that you can find this description of a plural God and the first place I would like to go is Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the Hebrew scriptures, in the Pentateuch, in the law of Moses, recorded by Moses, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 says, Reshith Elohim, anybody ever heard that word Elohim? Reshith Elohim, bara, eth shamayim, eth in the beginning, God, plural, masculine, created the heavens and the earth. And you go down just two verses, and the first person of the Godhead that gets notice is actually the Spirit hovered over the waters, right? But we go on through, and we go through chapter 1, and there are no pronouns. There are no substitutes. It just says Elohim, Elohim, Elohim. Elohim created on the first day, on the second day, on the third day. He looked, he said it was good, and Elohim did this, and Elohim did that. It goes on and on. But you get over into uh, chapter, or it's chapter 1, verse 26, and then he gets a pronoun. And look at the pronoun that he gets. God gets, I should say. Verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image. So the first pronouns ascribed to a plural masculine God are us and our. And as we go on down, verse 27, then we say, see his and he. And God is always referenced in the masculine throughout the scriptures. Now, not to try to pick a fight with anybody, but there are a lot of translations of the scriptures that have come out recently 
which have tried to go gender neutral or multi-gender. Do you? One, this is one of the things that I don't know how far I'll get or if I'll finish anything tonight. But do you know that the Bible that's in your hand that you're holding is copyrighted? It's copyrighted. You have to have permission from the publisher to use more than a couple verses. It's in one of those first pages that you never read when you get a Bible. Okay? And as time would go on, people would come up with new versions for English speakers, different version, and in some cases they would change them for a lot of different reasons, maybe to make it more contemporary. I'll be the first to say, the King Jimmy, I stumble over. The these and the thous are actually quite helpful, because you know if you're talking to one you or all of you, yeah. okay? But you have to learn Elizabethan English to really process it well. That's why I'm very grateful for the new King James Version. But it is copyrighted. The editors who then created this new version, they have a hold on it. You can't just take and do anything you want with it. Well, these people that have now come out with gender-neutral scriptures, one of, the, one of the things, and I have to be careful how I say this or why I would say it, but you have to understand why... Why are you doing this? What has motivated you to believe that somehow you have to take what we already have and change it? Now, many people would say we're going to improve upon it. And they can, they can argue their point all day long. But another side of this is that we can make money on it. You can create your own gender-neutral version of the Bible and sell it. You've got a copyright, and you, your editors, are going to make money. Now that is the kind of thing that I wouldn't want to be you. You know? Yeah. So at any rate, that's kind of going to the, the gender side of things. Um, there's also the theophanies, right? Which speak of more than one God. Classic. Theophany in the New Testament is when Jesus is, well, this isn't a theophany. Uh, theo is God, ophany is in an appearance. The theophanies and Christophanies, those are uh, appearances of God, because God is spirit, and you can't see him. And yet, Moses was just kicking around on the backside of the desert one day, and he saw a bush that looked like it was burning, but it wasn't consumed. And that's pretty unusual. But then the bush talked. And the bush told him who he was. I am that I am. It was God speaking. This is a manifestation, an appearance, a theophany of God. And there's many of them through the scriptures. We saw one not too many weeks ago with Balaam and the donkey and the angel of the Lord, that title that speaks of a manifestation of God's presence stood before the donkey, and the donkey says, I'm not going. And finally, Balaam's eyes were opened, and he realized he's dealing with God here. And there's many places throughout the Old Testament where a lot of people believe that was actually God just appearing as an angel, okay, looked to be in human form, or a bush, or however he would appear. Um, but we get on then not just to the Theophanies, but when Jesus was baptized. And there he is, the Son, God, in the flesh, in the water. He comes up out of the water, and out of heaven, a voice audibly speaks, and everybody heard it. This is my beloved Son. And the Spirit alighted on him. It came down as it were a dove, the way that it descended upon him. Just as we see the Spirit described in Genesis chapter 1, hovering over the face of the deep. And here the Holy Spirit, Father, and Son are all in one place. We see this in quite a few places. Then, in John's Gospel, we open up with, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. 
So God wasn't alone in the beginning. There was a word there too. And the word was God. Well, if the word was God, how could it be with God? Because there's more than one. And it goes on to say, he was in the beginning with God. Before anything ever came into existence, there was the Word and God. Both of them deity. Verse 3, all things were made through Him, speaking of this Word, and without Him nothing was made. That was made. In Him was the life, and the life was the light of men. This God possesses, possesses life. Before He even created anything, He was self-existent. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Okay? He's separate. He's holy. He's not like anything else. In verse 14 of John 1, we read, And the Word, God, was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. We looked upon Him. We could see Him. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And going down into verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Kind of going on, a couple other verses out of the New Testament. In Colossians, Paul writing to the church in Colossae, at chapter 1, verse 12, He's in the middle of one of his really long sentences, so I'm not going to read the whole sentence. But he picks up, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Now this is speaking of the Son. He is the in image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, or the thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he, Jesus, is before all things, and in him all things consist. Jesus is creator God. In John chapter 14, Jesus discussing his departure. I'm going to go away, but don't worry, I'll come back to you. In verse 6 of John 14, Jesus said to uh, Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From, and from now on, you know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father, so how can you say, show us the Father? Now, Jesus is God, the Son. God the Father is Spirit. God the Holy Spirit. They are all of the same essence, Godhead, deity. They are one, but they're distinct personalities. And, and finally, I'll just take us to Matthew chapter 28, uh, the Great Commission. And in here, we read, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority, not some of it, not one-third of it. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Does that mean the Father has no authority? No, of course not. The Father's God. He has all authority. But what about the Holy Spirit? Oh, He has all authority. Well, then who has all authority? Yeah. God has all authority. He says in verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of that is singular. It is not plural. There is only one name. The name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's the name. It's a long name. 
That's the name. Okay? And so, here we have um, Shema Israel, Hashem Eloheinu, Hashem Echad. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. A trinity. Possessing all power, all glory, all majesty, and worthy of all love and honor. So, now that we've met him, verse 5, and i got to just wrap it up here. We'll probably get to verse 9. <laughs> you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Now in this, the heart represents the spiritual component of a person. The soul represents the personality, the identity of a person, who I think I am, what makes Mike different than Brad. And then our strength, that's our physical characteristics or ability. Not, not our, um, what, what do we call that when we, our programming, right? Not the programming, but the, the physical manifestation. In Mark, in chapter 12, a lawyer, a young, a lo young lawyer came to Jesus and asked him, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus answered with this from the Shema. Everybody in Israel knows this is it. Right here, this is it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Everybody should know that answer. And so this is what Jesus says in Mark chapter 12, verse 28. Um, I'm sorry, verse 29. Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is here. Shema, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Jesus just added a little word there. He added mind, intellect, thinking. Now, can Jesus do that? Of course he can. Is he really changing anything? No. He's just helping us to see and to understand the point. It's not to say... I've checked my heart box. I've checked my soul box. I've checked my strength box. Don't check boxes. It's all of you. You're all in. And in Jesus' day, in the Greek culture, they put great coin on intellect. Intellect. Okay? And, and it was so important, your thinking. And so Jesus kind of gives a nod to that in verse 31. And second, and like it, is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And they all boil down to one four-letter word, love. Love. That's what the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, they all boil down to. Love. It's all about love, has always been about love, will always be about love. This is the reason why God created us, created a perfect world for us, put us federally through the agency of Adam and Eve into that perfect garden, and we, through Adam and Eve, sinned and fell. And you think, doesn't God know that's going to happen? I thought he's omniscient. I thought he knew everything. If he knew everything, why would he even do that? The answer is, he's God. love. He did it for love. He wanted a relationship with us based on love. Not binding, not robotic or animatronic or in some way just reacting when he pushes a button. He was creating with a, within us a, an agency, a free will that out of just receiving so much love, our natural response would be to love him back. And so that's the crucible that we find ourselves in today. That's the place humanity finds ourselves. Between the Garden of Eden and the new heavens and the new earth, we're in that process, we're in that place where we're able to work out 
the sin, give it to God, and fill up with love and give it to Him. And we're just in preparation. We're loving closer to Him every day. That's the idea. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Not just something you've memorized. Not just a refrigerator magnet or a bumper sticker or a t-shirt. It's something that you own. You hear it. It passes the ear gate. It goes in. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. And then as we have heard this word, then we live it out. We love it out. We obey and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently. In teaching. To take what you have and pass it on to somebody else. To give instruction. To help one become understanding and wise. To show them the way. To give them examples. To model for them. To demonstrate. To walk with them until they can walk on their own. To teach them diligently. Diligently is with effort and purpose. It's not by accident. And it's not lackadaisical or slipshod. It's something that we purpose that we are going to put effort into making sure our children know this, experience it, learn it, own it, that it's in their heart. That we transfer it to them. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them. And this is how you do it. It's really not rocket science. Talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. This isn't to say, well, I did every one of those. I did all four. I'm good. It's a picture of life. All of life is what's being laid out in front of these. You know, discipleship. Taking somebody and, and teaching them, training them up in the ways of God. It's far more caught than it's taught. Okay? People will catch it when they see you doing it. Or when you help them do it themselves and they catch it, okay? But if you just think you're going to sit down at a Bible study and I've got it, that's, that, I'm not saying that there's not a lot of value in that. I do it all the time. But at the end of the day, it's my mentors. And it's those who have gone before me. And those who are living it out in front of me. How I could live a good marriage with my wife. You know how I do that? I look at other Christians that are down the road in front of me that are doing it. And I try to observe them and see, how do you do this? Brothers and sisters walking with the Lord. How do you evangelize? How do you disciple? How do you pray? You see it. You watch it. You catch it. Okay? As they live it out. But this is diligent. It's purposeful. It takes effort. And it says in verse 8, You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Now this is something that has become known now amongst Orthodox Jews as phylacteries. A phylactery is a small box. It's often encased in leather, but it comes with long leather thongs. And there's a box that you would bind onto your hand, and it's kind of interesting, if you ever watch one, you could probably YouTube it. I was sitting next to a guy on a plane going to Israel, and it was like, it was six in the morning or something, and the, everybody was asleep, but he raised up the window, and the sun was coming up, and he was busy wrapping his phylactery, and he weaves each one of these songs around all these fingers, and he gets the one on his head, and he does all this, and he gets all ready, and these boxes, these phylacteries, contain this verse right here. Okay? As well as a couple other verses out of the Old Testament. And they're in these boxes. And the idea is, you're supposed to take this word and bind it on your hand. And so they do it. They bind it on their hand. And they bind it on their head. Okay? Where it says here um, that they would be faithful. Now, um, it says you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. Now, it's not for virtue signaling. Although some people might do that. Look at me. 
I'm a holy Jew. I got my phylactery on. <laughs> but the sign, the idea of it, it supports to point you to God, to point you back to God. And this whole business of one on your hand and as frontlets for your eyes, frontlets are better described as spectacles, glasses. It's what you see the world through. Oh, okay. So you should take these words and put them in your heart and teach them to their children and put them in front of your eyes all the time and see the world through these eyes, through this lens. And everything that you do and everything that you touch and everywhere you go, it should be done through the Word of God, towards God. So that's what these phylacteries represent. And then it goes on in verse 9, You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And you may have seen this. Yeah, you got it, Dennis. A mezuzah. A mezuzah is a little box. They're usually about six inches long, and they're a little bigger round than a finger or a thumb. And they contain <laughs> these verses also. And a couple other verses out of Deuteronomy. And they're rolled up in a small scroll, and then they're nailed to a door. And there's a specific way that you would nail it to a door. Um about halfway down and then when you go into the house and when you come out of the house you'll see practicing Jews kiss their fingers and touch the mezuzah what that's saying is in my going out and in my coming in in all that I do I love the word of God well that's good I hope you love the God of the word too because that's really what it's all about and that's what these phylacteries and mezuzahs and these signs are. Now, just a minute ago, I made a little bit of jest about uh, refrigerator magnets and bumper stickers and t-shirts. I don't think there's anything wrong with putting the words of God as signs before you. I think it's wonderful to have refrigerator magnets or whatever, something on the dashboard of your truck, whatever it takes to keep drawing you back to God. And thinking and lifting your thoughts to God. And Lord, what would you have me do now? And just constantly be soaking in his words. That his words could be soaking into you. Okay? And that's what this, this all is about. And so we're going to start, stop there. I could have, should have finished the chapter. Um, it's okay. But, yeah, it's going to be an awkward start when we start next, because it's going to be all about what happens when you disobey. <laughs> but God knows our heart. You know, and I like that part of the Bible. And when you stumble, what do you mean when I stumble? Yeah, when you stumble, this is how we're going to get you back. Oh, good. Praise God. Thank you. These Ten Commandments are kind of hard to keep. I know that. They're not something that I'm using to judge you. I'm using them to guide you and to draw you to me, that we could be in love together. So come on, let's do it again. And let's do it again. Amen? Amen. Father God, I want to thank you. And I pray that we have heard from you. That your word has penetrated beyond our hearing and into our heart. That we would love you and do these things as tokens of our love as just offerings of gifts of ways that we can just share our gratitude and our, our awe and wonder and joy and hope ways that we can enter into a deeper relationship with you and grow in that relationship with you. We thank you especially that you've given us your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. That when the way gets a little bit murky, or we wander off the path, we can just look to Jesus, and he will guide us back home. I know your spirit does, Father. I know your word does. And I thank you, Lord, that you've not left us as orphans, but that you've walked with us and will continue the work that you've begun in us 
until we arrive safely at home. Amen? Amen. Amen.